welcome to the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre seminar series. My name is Professor Louise Ryan and I'm Director of the Research Centre, along with the Deputy Director, Dr Maria Lopez, who's also here this afternoon. And we're absolutely delighted to be kicking off 2021 with the uh, new seminar series. Uh, the centre was set up last year, so we still kind of regard ourselves as a relatively new research centre, uh, but we're now launching into the second semester of our seminar series, which has been really successful so far and has surpassed all of our expectations. And we're really delighted to see so many people are turning up. 63 people are here for the seminar this afternoon and mm -hmm. counting. Uh, so that's fantastic. You're all very welcome. Um, and what we have agreed is that our two speakers are each going to speak this afternoon for approximately 25 to 30 minutes. And then after that, we will have um, a Q&A. When we have the Q&A, you are welcome to type your questions in the chat or if you would prefer to raise your hand and then we'll come to you and you can turn your microphone on and speak. Some people find that easier than trying to type out a long question into the chat, but please raise your hand if you would like to do that in the Q&A, which will be at the end. Uh, we are going to record this session. So um, if I could ask our colleague Anna, who's here, if she's um, ready to record and we will record the whole session, including the chat. So just be aware that the the um, sorry, the discussion, the Q&A is also being recorded, just so you're aware of that. Um, are we recording now? Would you like me to record, Anna, or have you pressed the record button? Just checking. Oh, recording in progress. Yep, yeah, the recording is in progress. Perfect. So without further ado, I'm now going to introduce um, our first speaker. I'll come to Professor Wessendorf, who is our second speaker afterwards, but I'll just begin by introducing our first speaker this afternoon. And so the, um, the overall theme of exclusion and belonging in super diverse contexts. Professor Suzanne Wessendorf will be our second speaker and our first speaker is Dr. Julius Elster and he is a senior lecturer here in the School of Social Professions at London Metropolitan University and Julius's talk is entitled Indifference Towards Difference? Question mark, young people on living together separately and I'm very excited because this is about um, young people in Tottenham and I have to confess that I come from a household of absolutely avid Tottenham football supporters so um, I'm hoping that there'll be at least some reference to Tottenham Hotspur in the course of the presentation or discussion. Over to you Julius. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Julius I think your sound is Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Julius. Before you've even started, I'm interrupting already. Your sound is a little bit um, unstable, so perhaps you could turn your camera off. Thank you. The, the camera is off now. Hopefully you can hear me better now. Yes, that definitely sounds better now. Thank you. OK, excellent. So no talk on uh, Spurs uh, will take place in my talk. So I apologize uh, to Louise for that, but I'm, I'm really grateful to the organizers, Louise and Maria and all the attendees for uh, turning up today. And I'm uh, particularly grateful to Louise for chairing this seminar. And it goes without saying, I'm looking forward to hearing Susanna Wessendorf's talk a little bit later. So I shall explore how diversity is experienced by young people who grew up in a super diverse social context and who themselves are from a range of ethnic and cultural backgrounds. So I'll be drawing on in-depth interviews with 18, 15 to 25 year olds from Tottenham. That's an area in, uh, in North London. So the answers that came up in the interviews when we visited themes associated with Tottenham's diversity were not necessarily the ones that I expected Yes, all the research participants had a very positive attitude towards diversity, but I expected their answers to revolve around the idea that with increased diversity comes individual choice. So a mix and match approach to identity and new life opportunities. I expected the, 
young people to speak about uh, diversity as enabling them to kind of have a pick and mix attitude towards identity that they can sample different uh, things from uh, other people in the community and integrate it into their own identities instead the young people mainly spoke about the fact that the um, super diverse context enables them to maintain their distinctive cultural and ethnic identities and the fact that diversity sometimes gives them a sense of belonging so I should start by providing a bit of context around my research and then I'll ask the question what is it like for young people actually growing up among people from a wide range of countries and cultural backgrounds and crucial to the answers of the research participants is the idea that difference is normalized there's nothing particularly remarkable about uh, uh, the idea of living among difference and this is of course reminiscent of uh, Paul Gilroy's notion of uh, conviviality the second part of my talk will um, be a discussion about some of the implications of living with diversity and here I'll particularly focus on the implications that are epistemic in character so for the purposes of uh, my talk epistemology or, or let's say epistemic stuff has to do with making knowledge claims so when i talk about young people making knowledge claims i mean expressing beliefs and opinions rooted in their worldviews and lived experience so I suppose I'm interested in, in the question of whether a diverse environment contributes to facilitating a relatively safe space where young people who otherwise might feel all mar marginalized can uh, make knowledge claims without being regularly subjected to unfair scrutiny, uh, misrepresentations or othering processes. So maybe a little caveat is in place, unlike uh, uh, Suzanne, who will be talking in a minute, super diversity is not something that I'm an expert on. I never plan to investigate young people's attitude towards diversity. The research participants' appreciation for their diverse surroundings emerged spontaneously from the data that are collected. So, those of you who are not familiar with the notion of superdiversity, I believe it was first coined by Stephen uh, Vertovec. And for Vertovec, it's important to stress that uh, super here doesn't only mean mega, uh, grand, big time diversity. But we are dealing with something that supersedes previous patterns of migration. Or, or diversity. In contrast to, for instance, uh, multiculturalism, superdiversity seems more of a uh, descriptive than a normative concept. So it's not associated with particular governmental policies. It tries to capture uh, the multidimensional perspective on diversity where ethnic background is one of many defining dimensions of difference uh, admittedly in today's talk my approach is more phenomenological though uh, it's more ph phenomenological than uh, an example of super diversity research since i'm uh, more interested in understanding how diversity is experienced by young people than looking at the different variables associated with super diverse communities so a bit of context around Tottenham. So here we see London to the left here and maybe it should have Thames flowing through. So Tottenham is located in Haringey, which is in North London. And um, you see a map of Haringey on your right hand side here. So according to the IMD, residents in the 10 
10th percentile areas shaded darkest on the map here are amongst the 10% most deprived small neighborhood areas in England. So as is shown on the map, the most deprived neighborhoods in Haringey are more heavily concentrated in the east here. And that is exactly where Tottenham is located. So Tottenham is um, culturally, ethnically, linguistically and uh, religiously diverse. In fact, it has been labelled the most diverse constituency in the world. So with about 200 first languages spoken, few other places can boast of a more diverse cultural and ethnic environment than this particular corner of North London. I suppose it's fair to call it a paradigm example of super diversity. So this bar chart shows a breakdown of residents in Tottenham by so-called broad ethnicity. It's perhaps a bit uh, unhelpful to use such broad categories, but I believe it still gives a clear indication that there's no longer an ethnic majority group that is dominant based on its demographic majority position. To be labelled super diverse, I believe that's perhaps uh, one criterion. So note the fact that the majority of white residents in uh, Tottenham are of uh, Turkish, uh, East or Central European or other white background. And this is not uncommon in super diverse areas in Britain. So despite the fact that um, Tottenham is obviously very diverse, there's been a tendency of the media and politicians and some social scientists to reduce residents in Tottenham to a single identity. And um, many of my research participants pointed out that, that they were often spoken about in homogeneous terms. So Temi here, for example, the, the names here have all been pseudonymized, of course. So Temi said, I don't get why some think we're all the same in Tottenham. Of course, most likely Tottenham residents are known to be diverse. So these negative and homogeneous representations are, of course, partly connected to the dominant discourse around the England riots. So for our international listeners, England riots started in Tottenham. And the spark that ignited the initial unrest was a response to the fatal shooting of Mr. Mark Duggan, an unarmed young black male from Tottenham's Broadwater farm estate. So since the uh, 2011 riots, stereotypical representations have been used to portray uh, residents in Tottenham and uh, one example of that is a report uh, labelled it took another riot and this was produced on behalf of Boris Johnson who was the mayor of London during the England riots. So this report spoke of Tottenham's residents as passive participants trapped in a vicious cycle of deprivation and degradation where unemployment, addictions, low education attainment, poor health, youth alienation and crime interconnect in a causal relationship as mutually reinforcing dynamics. So nobody who lives in Tottenham can uh, relate to that description. And there's so much positive stuff that can be said about Tottenham, including how the residents and young people in particular live and appreciate diversity. But I just remind the, the attendees to mute themselves uh, until uh, the Q&A is opening a little bit later. So as I've alluded to already, the ability to navigate and live with diversity doesn't preclude the ability to maintain distinctive group identities. 
here uh, we see many different ways, kind of oxymoronic phrases, I believe, that have been used to cover different aspects of a living with, with difference. Just one second here. Can I please ask people to mute their microphones? There's a lot of background noise. Please mute your microphone. Thank you. I think the, the noise is coming from those who have joined us via phones as opposed to online. So uh, one phrase that I usually use to describe the idea of living with a difference is the idea of living separately together. And I suppose this kind of encapsulate two great longings for humankind. This idea of being able to belong, a sense of belonging, but at the same time having the opportunity to develop an independent trajectory in terms of uh, identity formation. And you can see other ways of kind of describing uh, what it is like to live with difference. So what's implicit here is that residency neighborhood as a normal part of everything. But this typically does not extend beyond uh, the public. Beyond. So with, uh, within the private sphere, identities and activities are more embedded in their respective cultural heritages. So you see a bit of a kind of public-private sphere distinction here, where people are mingling in the public sphere, but can uh, nurture their um, distinctive identities within the private sphere. So how is diversity experienced among young people in Tottenham? So there were two types of answers that popped up in the interviews, and one here is by Ahusa, and she. Um, this has actually been lifted off a uh, website put together by Exposure, which is a youth communications charity in North London. And um, uh, she attended a workshop that took place at Tottenham's Burning Ground Art Centre, which I also attended. So her idea of uh, diversity is that it offers a kind of mix and match approach to identity. It kind of gives you new life opportunities. So she says, Tottenham hosts a diverse range of cultures and communities from all around the world. Such diversity offers great opportunities for different jobs, knowledge of other communities, new tastes, new fashion, new literature, the list is endless. But among my research participants, there were a different answer that was more prominent. So Amaya, for example, and other research participants spoke of the fact that their super diverse context facilitates a relatively safe and tolerant space, which enables them to maintain their cultural or ethnic groups, distinctive characters. And Amaya's experience of the benefits of diversity has been corroborated by a range of recent research studies on superdiversity. So, for example, according to Kirsten Fisser, uh, her research findings uh, talks about Tottenham's diversity as giving the young people a sense of belonging. So she speaks about the fact that they can be themselves, and also that uh, they're not constantly judged uh, in their neighborhoods. And uh, she carried out research in Tottenham and uh, Jamie Keston and Tatiana Moreira de Sousa, they also carried out research in Tottenham or, or more specifically Haringey. They spoke about the fact that diversity provides the residents with a sense of comfort and security and uh, so it's in general that, that there's lots of literature around um, 
the fact that diversity can provide a bit of a safe space for, for many of the residents. So how is this supposedly safe space or sense of belonging generated through living with diversity? So let's first look at how it could be a result of uh, normalization of difference. So an upshot of uh, living in a super diverse location such as Tottenham is the everyday negotiations across differences. And I'm here stealing uh, some of the words from uh, Susanna Wessendorf's book, uh, Commonplace Diversity. Fran Meissner, Meissner uh, she points out that for young people living in super diverse community, uh, different super, super diverse communities, diversity has become a habitual frame of reference. It's just a fact of everyday life. And one of my research participants, Camille, stated that it's just the norm to have lots of people from different cultures around you. And this, of course, forms the basis of what Paul Gilroy refers to as conviviality. So Amanda Weiss and Greg Noble, they spoke about conviviality as an orientation towards shared lives lived through difference. And here again we see that kind of oxymoronic way of phrasing the idea of living with difference. And I think crucially here, uh, convivial relations between members of diverse communities comprise what Valuvan is speaking about here, namely the idea of being at ease in the presence of diversity. That diversity is no big deal. And also the fact that ethnic, diver uh, ethnic differences are not constantly being measured up against a white majority, nor are they constantly being accommodated in relation to a white majority. So what is it that makes the young people feel relatively safe in a diverse setting? So I observed some positive epistemic consequences of experiencing diversity on an everyday basis. So in relation to Tottenham's diversity, research participants often spoke about being able to go about their business and express beliefs without being constantly reminded of their so-called minority status or reminded of their possible membership in a stereotype group or without being constantly juxtaposed or understood in relation to a white majority. And when you're not excluded from sharing your experiences and testimonies, then you're participating in knowledge production. And that's what I mean by epistemic consequences or epistemic implications. And I'm here, of course, borrowing from feminist social epistemology and in particular from uh, Christy Dotson and uh, Miranda Fricke. So in order to understand what may be involved in feeling what I here refer to as epistemically relatively safe in a diverse setting, we also need to look at the opposite, namely the idea of epistemic exclusion and oppression. So my research participants seem to be subjected to exclusion and epistemically oppressive practices on a regular basis as they ventured outside Tottenham into less diverse areas. So Lesedi here, she um, born in Kenya but brought up in Tottenham. So she said, those who live in less diverse neighborhoods often perceive me as different or other, or may not think that there's more to me. And Camille said something similar. She has a Bayesian background. 
So she sees less diverse areas as being uh, less tolerant. And she sometimes feel, feels uncomfortable uh, in these areas as people may not, as she said, see me as me, one individual. They may see me just as another black girl, she said. So unlike life in Tottenham, they said is secondary school is located in an area where one group forms a clear majority. So as a result, her classroom seemed to facilitate an environment that promoted a particular way of thinking or seeing the world. So she is a high achieving student and she spoke specifically about attending top set math classes. And she expressed how she remembers being othered by her fellow students. There was an atmosphere of me and them, and that she felt kind of small, because you can tell that you're different. So in this context, you, you're no longer indifferent to difference. Suddenly difference becomes a thing. You become aware of the fact that you may be different. So these negative experiences of um, epistemic uh, oppression, where, for instance, knowledge claims are not taken seriously as a result of uh, racist attitudes or other forms of identity prejudices, so these are experiences that took place in less diverse areas. They were often contrasted with more positive experiences in Tottenham. So based on what the research participants were saying, Tottenham's diversity seems to open the door for a form of um, what I shall call epistemic diversity. So what do I mean by this? So here we're talking about an environment which allows for different worldviews, different perspectives, ways of thinking, different lived experiences to exist alongside each other. So with epistemic diversity, you're not aiming to reach a consensus. It's not about agreement, a community where people are drifting towards one way of thinking. And when there is no longer an ethnic majority group that is dominant, then an unequal hierarchy of epistemic relations appears to be less likely to emerge so we're not here having a community where one group are kind of dictating how we should be thinking or what we should um, be leaning towards in terms of ideas and uh, experiences we should listen to and so on and so forth. So what does this look like? So Luke, he has a Ghanaian heritage and he seems to allow those different from him to kind of go about their business. So he said, I ain't gonna tell you how a Muslim brother should be thinking or what he should believe. He does his thing, I do mine. So here there's no attempt at rejecting the credibility of the knowledge claims of those different to him. And also living with everyday diversity is perhaps one reason why Sapphire appears to view others as individuated subjects, including those who are different from her. So she said, I don't get why you want to judge someone because they're different from you. I feel like because I lived in this area for quite a long time, you get to know some of the people. And what you realize is the people that are stereotyped aren't always what people think they are. So let me now try and sum up what I've been trying to argue here. So based on several in-depth interviews with young people in Tottenham, the diversity that is evident in spaces such as Tottenham creates a feeling of difference as 
normal. So there's nothing particularly remarkable about having a wide range of people who are different around you. And this can lead to an environment that allows for several modes of knowing. And for these different modes to exist alongside each other. So this in turn can lead to firstly, the young people can as a result maintain a strong identification with their ethnicity and heritage culture but also this could allow young people to contribute and have access to shared epistemic resources within a given epistemic community. It allows people to be able to express themselves and their testimonies may be more likely to be viewed as valid than perhaps in an environment where uh, a white majority is dominating. So all in all, uh, this can lead to a relatively safe epistemic environment, especially for those who may feel marginalized by different systems of oppression. And the reason for this is because there seems to be less chance of a majority group rejecting the credibility of their knowledge claims, but also the fact that there is less chance of a hierarchy of epistemic relations between those who have more epistemic authority and those who have less. So <laughs> I suppose this is nothing more than a postulation based on a relatively small sample of young people living in a very particular corner of North London with a very particular history. So it goes without saying, uh, the picture that I painted today is a bit more complex and uh, much more research is required in this area. So I suppose on that note, I should hand the mic back to Louise. And I'd just like to say thank you for tuning in and I'm looking forward to hearing Susanna's talk in a minute and also looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Julius. That was really excellent and so engaging. And I, as you have the references there in front of us, I want to congratulate you on your article in Sociological Review, uh, which is a, a very, very high impact journal. So congratulations on getting your uh, paper based on this research on Tottenham published in that journal. Well done. Um, so I'm sure many of you have questions for Julius, but I'd ask you to hang on to them, write them down, and um, we'll come back to them in, a, in about 30 minutes, because I would now like to hand over to Professor Susan Vessendorf, who's somebody I've known for, for many years, and I'm absolutely thrilled that she's speaking today in this session with Julius. So Suzanne is um, an anthropologist, and she did her PhD at the University of Oxford. And then previously, when I first met her, she was at the University of Birmingham. Uh, interestingly enough, in the Institute for Research into Superdiversity, IRIS, uh, she then moved to the London School of Economics, but she's now professor at uh, the University of Coventry. So congratulations on, on that uh, relatively recent appointment in the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. So Suzanne's talk today is entitled Social Exclusion, Symbolic Boundaries and Convivial Labour in East London's Context of Ongoing Immigration. So we're moving from North London to East London. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Louise, for your kind words. And thank you both to Julius and uh, Louise to, for inviting me to this, to this seminar. I'm gonna turn my camera off now just for quality um, reasons, but my slides are up. So um, I'm gonna talk about a research project that I'm currently undertaking in Newham in East London. And it looks at the overlayering of old and new immigration. And with this, I refer to areas where you have had um, large-scale post-war immigration and where there are now established ethnic minorities and since then and especially more recently there has been ongoing immigration from various parts of the world. Now in Newham you have large numbers of people of mainly South Asian background but also of Caribbean and African backgrounds and they have been there for up to three generations. 
And this is coupled with the immigration of newcomers from many different places. Recently, immigration from Eastern Europe has been the most noticeable, but there are also newcomers from Latin America and other parts of Europe and Africa. Now, most studies on attitudes towards newcomers focus on white British people. So there's been a, a range of studies um, on how especially people in more disadvantaged areas, also described as left behind areas, how they feel resentful towards newcomers because of competition over resources like jobs and housing. But many new migrants actually um, settle in places which have already been settled by previous migrants. Now we know very little about how these long established migrants and ethnic minorities react to new immigration. And often these areas are disadvantaged as well. So my project wanted to look at what, it, what it's like for these long established ethnic minorities to deal with newcomers and how their reactions towards newcomers are related to existing inequalities and potentially their own experiences of exclusion, especially in regards to racism. Now in Newham, Eastern European immigration has been the most noticeable and this isn't um, something, this is um, not only something that I have found in regards to statistics, but also during my fieldwork. So when I asked local residents about changes in the area in regards to the population, every single person mentioned Eastern Europeans. So today I will specifically focus on reactions towards Eastern European migrants. So first I'll introduce you a little bit to the borough of Newham and the research background, and then I'll focus on two emerging findings of the project. Um, one relates to long-established ethnic minorities' um, experiences of racism and Islamophobia, and how they deal with it in their everyday lives. And the second theme looks at how these experiences impact on their attitudes towards white, white Eastern European newcomers. And to make sense of all of this, I have found it quite useful to draw on some sociological theories on conviviality and boundary making. So, you know, with conviviality, this talk leads, really, leads on really well from Julius's talk earlier. Now, to start, I'm going to take you straight to Newham. So, this is on Green Street in Newham. And as you can see, there is a large number of South Asian shops and businesses. And places like this could also be described as areas of ethnic minority predominance, where you have residential clusterings of ethnic minorities. Now, so, although some of the original immigrants to these areas and their children have moved away, many of them have, have made these neighborhoods their homes and their presence is visibly marked by shops, restaurants and services like taxi firms and religious institutions. Now, this is also on Green Street and as you can see, it's a Romanian shop. And this shop is right next to one of the many Asian shops which dominate the street. And this one was closed for prayer when I was there. So this example captures what is currently happening in many urban areas in Europe and beyond. It shows how new migrants often settle in areas which have already been settled by previous migrants. And areas with large numbers of ethnic minorities and newcomers have also been described as arrival areas. So in these places you have so-called arrival infrastructures which support newcomers. And here are just a few pictures which exemplify such arrival infrastructures in Newham. So they range from English classes to immigration advice, money transfer agencies, as well as informally rented rooms advertised in newcomers' languages. So the project that I talk about today looks at how, established, how long established ethnic minorities react to this new immigration and how newcomers adapt to areas of ethnic minority predominance. But I won't be talking about the newcomers themselves today, I'll just focus on the long established. And I look at how long term experiences of stigmatization among long established ethnic minorities impact on the reception of newcomers and how socioeconomic precariousness might shape these processes. Now, 
as I said earlier, I will situate these processes within sociological and anthropological theories on conviviality. Scholars working on conviviality are interested in looking at how people who live in demographically diverse contexts live together successfully. They look at how people rub along despite potential for tensions resulting from cultures, cultural and religious differences. Now, I found the convivialities approach quite fruitful when looking at my empirical material. Rather than only focusing on processes of exclusion and discrimination, a conviviality approach enables us to recognize people's capacity to live together peacefully and to examine what kinds of strategies they develop to do so. Now, of course, this includes recognizing the existence of discrimination and racism, but it also sheds light on people's skills to manage interactions across cultural, religious, linguistic and class differences in everyday life. Now briefly about Newham. Um, Newham is in East London. And as I said, it's a classical immigrant reception area where new arrivals find their feet and where relatively affordable rental houses, housing can be found. It's also one of the most deprived areas in Britain with high unemployment and a high rate of child poverty. Now, in fact, Newham performs worst or below London average across most indicators such as employment rate, low incomes, economic, um, economic activity rate, etc. In terms of ethnicity, the borough has the lowest proportion of white British people in England and Wales, and more, more than 42% of the population were born outside um, the UK. The area also has a high population turnover rate. So in 2015, for example, 37% of the population had been in Newham for less than five years, and only 44% had been there for more than 10 years. Only 39% of the population have English as their first language. And since EU accession in 2004, Newham has seen the arrival of increasing numbers of Eastern Europeans, which in some areas in Newham have now reached 11% of the population. And the main countries um, where these people come from are Poland, Romania and Lithuania. And here on the slide, these are represented as the white other. In terms of methods, I'm a social anthropologist and the research was primarily qualitative. Um, as part of my fieldwork, I have attended various community groups like a weekly knitting group in a library, a monthly coffee morning in a different library. Um, I undertook um, interviews with local residents, both long established and newcomers. Um, I did focus group interviews with long established residents of different ages. And I also spoke to experts like teachers, policemen and social workers. And of course, I had many informal conversations with people working in cafes and shops. And so far, more than 100 individuals have participated in my research. Now, in order to understand the long established minorities attitudes towards newcomers, we need to understand their own current situation in Newham and the UK more broadly in regards to their sense of inclusion or exclusion. And I first focus on um, racism and Islamophobia, and towards the end of my talk, um, I'll also look at the impact of socioeconomic disadvantage. Now, I spoke to different generations of ethnic minorities, and there was a general sense that racism had decreased over time. I have heard many accounts of how terrible it was at the beginning, with children having bricks thrown at them in the 1970s, people having dog poo put in their letter boxes, etc. And this kind of everyday racism was reported to have very much decreased over time. Now, in fact, um, young people reported very few experiences of everyday racism, at least within the areas in Newham where they lived. So again, this um, reflects um, Julio's findings. However, they also talked about how differently they felt when they left their area and went to more white British areas in other parts of London or the UK. And even within Newham, there were no-go areas because they were perceived as too white and racist. 
Also, there were reports of continuous institutionalized racism, for example, in regards to finding jobs and in regards to stop and search activities by the police. While everyday racism on most of Newham streets de decreased, many Muslim research participants clearly felt that Islamophobia massively increased since 9-11. Now, I know that this isn't any news to any of us, but I still found it quite striking how strongly people talked about the difference before and after 9-11. Now, there's a large and sophisticated scholarship on racism, um, but what interests me here is, is people's everyday strategies of dealing with stigmatization and how this relates to the immigration of new white migrants. And here I would like to draw on Greg Noble's work on what he describes as everyday labor of intercultural connection. Amanda Wise has used this idea in her work on convivial labor, and she describes how, and I quote, the everyday practice of living together takes work, end of quote. So it's about negotiating differences in everyday life, and this can be hard work. Now, I want to build on this notion and develop it a bit further by showing different patterns of convivial labor which came up in my empirical material. In Newham, I have found plenty of instances of what could also be described as easy conviviality. So people getting along across differences, helping each other out in public space, for example, when getting on buses, etc. Some of these instances could also be described with the notion of civility, which refers to people behaving in a civil manner in public space, regardless of other people's looks or backgrounds. Now, convivial labor refers to more conscious efforts to get along which go beyond civility. One of my research participants simply said, we have to get along which pointed to the fact that it can't be taken for granted and it takes some work. An example of this is food sharing or forms of neighborly reciprocity. So for example, an East, a East African Indian woman who came here in the 70s talked about how she was looking for a Chinese New Year card for her Chinese neighbors. And she did so because in previous years, her Chinese neighbors had always brought over some food for the occasion. In addition to these proactive patterns of convivial labor, I have found other patterns which specifically relate to experiences of exclusion. And these involve specific actions which should contribute to good relations or prevent negative actions. And they are formed in response to experiences of Islamophobia or racism. So for example, among Muslim women, I have found specific efforts to maintain and create peaceful relations with people who might have negative views about Muslims, as well as with people more generally. So one of my female British Muslim research participants said in a focus group that she always tries to be extremely helpful with other people in public space. For example, she offered an elderly lady to carry her shopping bags and she always smiles at people. She said that we are portraying that we are not like that, whatever image she, the elderly lady, has in her head. She also said that she finds that we have to make that effort more because we are Muslims and we've got scars. Another woman in a different focus group also talked about how we have to prove ourselves. Now, Kay, a British Muslim woman born and bred in Newham, she told me the following episode, which really captures these strategies of maintaining peaceful relations, and also how, does the, how this can be hard work in the face of racism. This is what she says. You know car boot sales? The best ones are on farms, like Essex have a lot of them, and I love going there. So we. So when we went up to these, I would make sure I wore a light colored headscarf because I found that when I wore all black, the English were very hostile there. That's where I was going to encounter a lot of English from closed community, if you like. We used to call it my Essex hijab because it was white. So I'd go in my Essex hijab just to lighten the mood a little bit. When they could see I could speak English with a Cockney accent, that was their first shock. I once got in the way of someone with my trolley 
And the guy said something like, oh, run me over, why don't you? And so I turn around very politely and say, oh, did I nearly knock you out there? I'm really sorry. He was just taken aback. No, love, that's okay, no worries, you carry on. And I turned around and thought, hmm, you thought I didn't speak English. And then when I come through with a Cockney accent, it's a different story. Now, why Kay's reaction to racism was very proactive, there are also less active forms of convivial labor with which people react to racism and Islamophobia. So for example, at one of the coffee mornings at the library, there were, there were about four um, born and bred white British residents in their 70s. There were also about eight ethnic minority residents of South Asian and Caribbean backgrounds. And when I asked about changes in the area, the white British openly talked about how there were now too many Muslims in the area, that they had taken over, that it was the League of Nations now, etc. Now, none of the other participants reacted, which really surprised me. The woman running the group was of South Asian Muslim background, and the white British people knew her very well, and they were extremely friendly with her congratulated her to her wedding with big hugs, etc. But at the same time, they were making these really racist remarks in front of her. Now, I found out later that she felt very uncomfortable about this, but didn't want to say anything to avoid tensions. The next coffee morning was run by a social worker of African origin. And again, one of the white British people made rather controversial remarks about the British Empire and how the Brits brought the railways ways to these colonies and built up these places. And none of the ethnic minority coffee drinkers said anything, and neither did the social worker. When I asked him later how he copes with these kinds of situations, he told me that he did not want to alienate the white British and cause more tensions within the group. A Caribbean woman who was present at the coffee morning told me later that she was used to this. She has worked as a nurse for many years and says that she has often experienced this kind of racism within her work. And she felt like it was pointless to react to such racist remarks. So by, standing, by staying quiet and not addressing the issue, she and the other members of the Coffee Morning quietly contributed to the conviviality of the group. Now, of course, this is not easy conviviality, but it's laborious and it leaves a rather bitter aftertaste. Michelle Lamont and her colleagues identified this kind of reaction to stigmatization as not responding because a response is perceived as pointless and there is little hope for, cha for change by responding. It could also be described as aspirational conviviality because it demonstrates how people are keen to prevent relationships from breaking down, even in the face of the extremely disrespectful behavior of the white British coffee drinkers. And with this notion of um, aspirational conviviality, I now want to turn to attitudes towards Eastern Europeans. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when asking long established residents about changes in the area, all of them first mentioned the number of Eastern Europeans moving in. So this is definitely something very much experienced as a rapid change. Aspirational conviviality was expressed in a focus, focus group with ethnic minority mothers at a primary school, and they expressed the wish to, for more opportunities to meet parents at, this, at the school who are from other places like Eastern Europe and with whom they didn't have much opportunity to interact. They criticized Eastern Europeans for not wanting to mix, for example, at the school gates or playgrounds. Now, in an earlier study, I have conceptualized this expectation that people should mix across ethnic and religious differences as ethos of mixing. Ethnic minority residents express this ethos of mixing through expectations that newcomers should speak English. And one of the main complaints about Eastern Europeans was that they spoke their own languages in public space or at the workplace, and they did not make enough effort to speak English. They, they contrasted this with their own histories of immigration, 
emphasizing that their parents always encouraged them to speak English in public space, even if they themselves didn't speak English. Now, I find this interesting because the criticism that the newcomers don't want to mix is exactly what many British Muslims are criticized for, both in public and policy discourse. Another sentiment about Eastern Europeans is related to how people feel about groups of Eastern Europeans in public space. And this is directly related to notions of civility and order. One of the repeated criticisms that came up was that they drink in public space, something that especially Muslim residents find difficult to accept. Also, there was much criticism of increased begging on the streets, which was ascribed to Romanians. Both drinking and, and begging clearly breaks rules of civility and conviviality in the views of these participants. Now, these issues around civility and order have been observed in many contexts of insider-outsider constellations in neighbourhoods across Europe and beyond. So, for example, Andreas Wimmer observed it in relation to Swiss cities in the early 2000s, and Sandra Wallman observed it in South London already in the 1980s. The civility and order are among the main issues of contention in contexts characterized by rapid population changes. However, resentment against newcomers is also related to socioeconomic conditions and competition over resources. And I now have a rather long quote, but it really captures these feelings. And the quote is taken from a focus group with mothers of ethnic minority background at a primary school. And all of them are British Muslims, except for Sharon, who is of Caribbean um, background. And um, this is a rather long quote, it's two slides. So I think I'm gonna let you read it yourselves, give you a bit of time and then, and then I'll speak again. So when I asked them about Eastern Europeans, um, they said the following. Now actually, if someone cannot read on the slide, um, if some, somebody has visual impairments, please let me know and I will read it out, just speak up. I hope it's okay if I move on to the next one. Okay, so this discussion illustrates the mixed feelings these women have about the newcomers. Importantly, the negative views about newcomers have to be placed in the context of precariousness. These women are worried about the future of their children. So Sharon, for example, a mother of three sons and one daughter, is worried about her children's future as well as their safety when out and about in public space. There has been an increase in knife crime in the area and because of cuts in services, some of the youth centers and services have shut down. A lot of the discussion in the focus group was around lack of opportunities for their children and how they don't know where to go during their spare time. Sharon feels that her and her children's lives are characterized by this increased insecurity. And this precariousness is also shaped by the fear of losing her job in a large supermarket due to increased competition. Now, despite this resentment about newcomers and the view that they have it easier because of the color of their skin, the discussion also shows empathy towards the newcomers and how histories of migration and the struggles of their parents' settlement have not been forgotten. 
Now, while their lives, while their views kind of wavered between empathy and resentment, the mothers, as well as other research participants, described interact interactions on the ground as um, similarly nuanced. So, for example, the women talked about how if their children make friends with Eastern European children, they do sometimes meet the mums on the playground and smile at each other. Other research participants talked about neighborly relations with Eastern Europeans, how their neighbors would share a barbecue with them or tell them to take their washing in because they were having a barbecue. Now, to analyze these findings, I have found Andre Andrea's women's work on boundary making really useful. Drawing on earlier work on boundary making, he talks about how the dominated sometimes strategically and successfully adopt cultural boundary markers in order to disidentify with other minorities or their own ethnic category and gain acceptance by the majority. So this is exactly what the women in the focus group did when emphasizing that their parents always spoke English in public space in contrast to Eastern Europeans who speak their own languages. So I hope to have presented to you a nuanced picture of the workings of conviviality and stereotypes in this context of old and new immigration. Now, all in all, ongoing racism, Islamophobia and disadvantage are much bigger issues in the lives of ethnic minorities in Newham than new immigration. New immigration is generally only seen as a problem when it comes to issues around civility and order in public space and when it comes to competition over resources like housing and jobs. Of course, these issues also feed into stereotypes about the increase of, an unknown, of, of unknown white newcomers who get the jobs more easily, drink on the street and leave rubbish on the street. And these stereotypes are further exacerbated by the media. Stereotypes, however, coexist with empathetic views of the hardship of more recent arrivals, as well as more positive social relations on the ground. And these empathetic views have also been expressed in relation to Brexit. Importantly, conviviality, which goes beyond civility in public space, takes effort. And this is the case in regards to relations with everybody living in the area, as well as with more recently arrived, uh, recently settled migrants. Now, I hope to have shown you that there are different forms of convivial labor in reaction to racism. While some specifically attempt, attempt to deflate raci racism by showing kindness in public space or trying to make a good impression, others put in convivial labor by ignoring racist remarks, and both strategies are hard work. Now, I guess this kind of convivial labor could also be applied to other categories, like gender and sexu sexuality. So for example, when women ignore patronizing or sexist remarks. Now, I also hope to have shown how these processes are very much shaped by socioeconomic precariousness. And this was exemplified by Sharon, who was also in the focus group that I quoted. And she finds it difficult to reconcile her socioeconomic marginalization with accepting the arrival of supposedly more successful newcomers who, according to her, and I quote, don't even speak English, but get the jobs because they are white. And I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So much food for thought in that presentation and uh, the, the photographs as well, I think, really beautifully evoked the context, uh, which was really nice. So we've had two excellent presentations which spoke to each other very, very well in terms of you know, looking at different parts of London, uh, but very much um, pulling out some very shared themes. So I hope that there are lots of questions and comments. For those of you who've joined late, I'll just repeat, if you want to type your question in the chat, you can do so. But alternatively, if you'd like to put your hand up, uh, you can also ask your question rather than having to laboriously type it all out. Um, maybe while 
as there aren't any hands up immediately uh, and while people are getting ready to, to formulate their question, I can very quickly start by, by just making a few very quick observations. Don't worry, I won't abuse my position as chair. So I was just thinking, first of all, Julius, when I was listening to your presentation, it was just so powerful in terms of these young people who felt very comfortable in a context of, of super diversity, in a context where everybody was different and therefore nobody stood out for being different. But then it made me think about their life chances um, in terms of jobs and, and other opportunities because I, I did a research myself a few years ago on young people's transitions from school to work. And this was one of the issues that came through very much in that research, that young people who lived in particular neighbourhoods within London rarely left those neighbourhoods. And many of the young people that we were interviewing, quite shockingly, had never been to central London. It was like central London was a completely different place that they didn't go to, that they didn't feel comfortable in. And so that really had knock on consequences for their jobs because they just didn't feel comfortable going to the places where potentially the most job opportunities were. So I'm just wondering in terms of kind of thinking that through for life chances. And, and then um, Suzanne, I was very struck by the convivial labor, this concept of convivial labor. And, and I was thinking about it as an embodied experience as well and when you were talking about the um the essex hijab i thought that was such a beautiful story and such a catchy it's you know what it's like when a participant says something and you immediately <laughs> see the quote and you think that would make a great title for a paper uh, but, it made, <laughs> but it made me think as well about presentation of self and and in my own work i've used goffman's presentation of self about how people present themselves very carefully and cautiously in different areas and they're very aware of how their sort of self-perception is perceived by, by different audiences in different locations. So I just wondered if maybe there was some kind of a, a way of connecting embodied convivial labour with, with some sort of presentation of self. Anyway, I'll pause there and give you an opportunity to answer and then I'll throw it open to everybody else to raise their questions. Julius, maybe would you enough like for me to answer? So I'm going to try and answer with my video, with my camera on, and just give me a an indication if it if it's a disaster. So basically, my research perhaps could translate into longitudinal research, in which case I would be in a better position to answer your question about the uh, life chances. Uh, it didn't pop up in many of the interviews, um, how they uh, navigated employment. But uh, because I have experience of working with young people in the same area, prior to I, I embarking on the research, I had plenty of, it, uh, plenty of stories, narratives, and testimonies, which points to what you alluded to in your own research. So if I can just point out one particular case. So a, a young black man um, who attended a program called Great Grass and the aim of that program was to learn about um, IT programming and it was run by Cisco in conjunction with Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. You so did he, mention it. You did mention yeah, I, it. I did mention it finally uh, but, it, but I'm going <laughs> That's it. I'm going to move swiftly <laughs> on. Sorry. So, uh, so he, uh, this young black man was a computer wizard. He, he could uh, dismantle a computer and put it back together. Again. Uh, and he was uh, awarded quite a lucrative apprenticeship that took place in West London. And uh, of course, the the manager of the program was thrilled and very proud of it and used it as a case study to flag up the wonderful program that they were running. But none of the people actually understood the complexities here of um, the idea that you're surrounded by people who do not see difference as particularly remarkable. They don't scrutinize you on a regular basis. They don't try to accommodate you. It's just the norm, like one of my research participants said, that people around you are different. 
So he, I, I spoke to him on a regular basis, um, and he hated this apprenticeship. He hated the traveling to, to West London, but he also hated working there, but he found it hard to put his finger on what it was that he hated about it. So what came up after speaking to him many times, and also the fact that I'm a white man, perhaps made it hard for him to articulate or express himself. But um, he, um, he said that they were constantly seeing him as somebody different in the work environment uh, there. And they were, um, I, I mean, there were many good intentions as well, trying to accommodate him, making him feel special. But he it made him feel very awkward. And uh, what I have in mind here is Christy Dotson's notion of epistemic smothering, which basically is about an individual truncating her or his uh, expressions or testimonies because the audience is not receptive to uh, the answer that you may be given. So he was silencing himself and he, he just kept himself to himself. And as a result, it was a horrible experience. And I think that there are some other young people who may uh, testify to that. But that was one isolated experience. It could also be that uh, many of the young people I interviewed, they were very good at navigating many different environments. But it, it can be problematic when you go out there into a, an environment where uh, there is a white majority and then a lot of what you are thinking and saying may be measured up against this majority way of thinking. Yeah, th thank you very much. And that was such a powerful anecdote. I'll pass over to Suzanne and then I can see some questions are appearing in the chat. So Suzanne, would you like to? address yeah, the previous also, question. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting questions. I think the two actually relate because what Julius was just talking about is also related to the presentation of the self and the knowledge of how to present yourself. Now, um, Melissa Butcher at Birkbeck um, University has done, done some really interesting work on youngsters in Hackney, on um, black youngsters and their reaction to gentrification. But part of that was also about a program which enabled black youngsters in Hackney to access jobs in Shoreditch in the IT sector or in the creative industries. And I think one of the outcomes was that they just, even at the job interviews, um, didn't know how to present themselves because they didn't have the knowledge or the habitus to speak the right language. Um, and not just linguistic language, body language, you know, so I thought, you know, that I thought that was really interesting that there was just this lack of, of, of knowledge and, and skills and different expectations from, from both sides. Um, and, you know, what, what you say about the embodied experience in convivial labor and the presentation of the self is very much came out in, with the Muslim women, you know, when one of them says, I'm always smiling to make people see that I'm different, that I'm nice and I'm not a threat. Um, and I think there's also something gendered about it. I think there's different gendered ways in, in which people present themselves and, and sort of enact this convivial labor and attempt not to look like a threat. And I think it's a constant underlying thing in public space. And it's probably hard work. <laughs> Um, and just lastly, very quickly, I had a Somali student at LSE and she um, was from North London and she actually worked on a programme. She brought young people from North London into central London and showed them around the LSE and because of exactly that reason, to, to sort of show them, look, you can go into these places. These places, places aren't just for the others. They aren't just for the powerful. They are for everybody. But to, yeah, and lastly, very quickly, when I did my Hackney research for the Commonplace Diversity book, I went to, the, um, to South London on a bus that we organised as part of a youth club on a council estate, and we get to the Thames, and all the whole bus, all these kids from this council estate, go, oh mm -hmm. look, it's London. Once they <sighs> meet the Thames, and you know, we're in London. 
And they were all really thrilled. And it just showed how they don't often do it. They don't often leave their area. So, yeah. Yeah, really powerful point. In fact, many of our participants also said that, that I don't go to London. So they didn't yeah. see the neighbourhoods where they lived as London. So yeah. we've got questions. The first question is yeah. for you, Julius, and it's from Farida. And Farida says, super diversity might be allowing young people to maintain ethnic identity and cultural heritage, but doesn't it also encourage people to treat difference as a fixed category, therefore emphasize the socially constructed differences? Yeah, that's a brilliantly formulated question there. So thank you, Farida. Uh, yes, I think the answer is yes. But if I can elaborate. <laughs> Please uh, elaborate a bit, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think you, you, you spot on that. There can be tendencies of that when you are uh, in a position where you can nurture and uh, give attention to identifications connected to your heritage culture. Uh, I, don't particularly, I don't see that as a particular uh, negative thing in itself. Uh, you know, we can't all be... Uh, postmodernist or uh, social constructionists uh, in relation to our own identity. But I also uh, felt that many of the students, and I think I gave an example of that right at the end of the presentation, where they, uh, they didn't see uh, people who were different from them as stereotypical categories. They didn't say, see them as... as um, belonging to particular categories. There were no kind of clear examples of essentialist thinking among the young people that I interviewed. But for, for many of the young people, they just felt that they had the opportunity to keep their identity without feeling uh, that they had to, um, without being constantly challenged. So, uh, at least among the uh, young people that I interviewed, uh, I mean, it, that says maybe something about the young people who volunteer themselves to, they put themselves forward to be interviewed. Uh, this is perhaps a reflexive methodological question. But uh, I think that the young people I interviewed, they felt that they had the opportunity to keep their identity and maintain their own identity while also potentially um, fluctuate from uh, uh, from the heritage culture yeah that's a really complex issue so you're yeah. raising a very yeah, very important question there Farida I've now got a string of questions for you Suzanne so I'll try to to do all three uh, at least two of them are linked so the first question for you is from Kathleen and it says amidst the convivial labor which seems to implicitly perpetuate the status quo, were there instances of other forms of labour orientated to challenging the status quo and perhaps seeking transformative change? So that's one question, if I can just leave that with you for a moment. And then the next two questions are linked, both for Suzanne again. Um, so did any of the research participants discuss experiences of racism directed towards them from Eastern European people locally? And if so, did they discuss their responses and whether these involved convivial strategies? And then a related question um, is, I wonder if the participants were also asked about their experiences of racism and whether there was any analysis of this as to how they would shape their reaction to Eastern European newcomers. Can you see the chat, Suzanne? It, it might help if you actually saw the question written down. It's from yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if we last, would like to Sorry, the last turn, question, I feel like, sorry. Um, Ugo, would you like to turn your microphone on and perhaps ask your question? Because I may not be doing it justice. Ugo? Um, maybe Ugo is not able to turn his mic. Oh, he is, yeah. Hello, Ugo. Hello. Hi, yeah, I'm actually busy. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was just, I mean, to be honest, maybe um, is it Elvira should be the one because I'm basically piggybacking off of their question. And it's just because I saw that they asked whether the, 
research participants are asked to describe, discuss their experiences of racism for newer Eastern European migrants. And I'd actually also have the same yeah. question, which is why I just. Okay. Up. Yeah. Now I get it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'd start with this one and then I'll do the one about convivial labour and transformative change. Um, so I only have one anecdote, sort of one account of experiences um, among ethnic, um, ethnic minorities of, of racism by Eastern European migrants. Only one mentioned it. It's a very um, contentious issue and that is the reason why I think people didn't talk about it but this person it was interesting because she had gone away from the area for a while she'd gone abroad she's of Muslim background and then came back and suddenly all these Eastern Europeans were there and she felt threatened by a group of men at a street corner and um, did not have a convivial strategy to deal with it but just walked away um, I think there's also gendered implications here. So I, unfortunately, I don't really have any empirical material on this. Um, but I know of other people who have written about this. Um, um, Magdalena Novitska, for example. So if you want to get in touch, I can send you some references. I mean, there are some reports of um, racism by Eastern Europeans against long established ethnic minorities, but it's not something I specifically asked about. Um, regarding the question about convivial labour and transformative change, so um, you say that it, it sort of seems to perpetuate the, the status quo, and I agree with that. That's what, what came out of my material. Um, but I would say that some people try to push back a little bit. So, for example, Kay, at the, with her Essex hijab at the market, she stood up for herself um, with, with humour. And, and sort of turned around and um, was very um, more proactive about it. She didn't just sort of retreat, and, and but, but she actually confronted him by speaking with a Cockney accent and just saying, hey, what's the problem kind of thing. Um, whether that leads to transformative change, I doubt it. Um, so other research participants expressed anger, of course, about everyday racism, but um, I wish I could report initiatives or sort of convivial labour relating to transformative change of, of those who, who are the perpetrator, perpetrators of, of racism. But unfortunately, it's not something I have encountered um, in, in, in this project. And I think, yeah, I think that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so if anybody has a question, would they like to turn their microphone on and ask? Any other questions? We're coming up to almost half past. So if anybody has a question, Maria, have you got a question? You've yes, suddenly I popped do. up. Excellent. Over to Maria. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, well, Julius, thank you so much. And also, um, Susan, for your um, wonderful presentations and as a um, and as Louis mentioned, they are very powerful and they bring into consideration many aspects. So I was thinking all my, about my, all my students from gender and sexuality and racism, ethnicity and political violence today and and how they would benefit. I, I hope some of them are among us. So, uh, Susan, I've got a very um, a specific question for you about these convival labor and and in that uh, particular uh, frame of civility and order and everything that you explained about eastern european and i wonder if because you mentioned that very briefly about how this could be uh, the conviviality notion how could, how could this be applied to the notions of gender and sexuality if there was some sort of uh, if you could just expand a bit about all these differences and problems for women, particularly for women um, from a poor and working class um, environment, um, the problems they've got to, yeah, to 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 join society and be accepted, etc. I think that is a difficult one to answer. Um, because I did not ask about, you know, um, issues around sexism and 
and people sort of, yeah, as I said, we're ignoring sexist remarks. That that was more coming from, you know, my own experiences and 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 hearing from others in everyday life, but not so much as part of this research. But I do wonder whether, I mean, and I also have to admit, like all of these qualitative research projects where you do participant observation, they're very, you know, your own position, positionality is so important. So I did spend a lot more time with women than with men. So a lot of my um, a lot of my material is from female groups, not the coffee mornings, not the one with the elderly people that I talked about, but the knitting group and the focus group at the school that was all women. And I think, you know, the fact that women felt like they had to always be friendly in public space, they had to smile in public space, there is a coming together of ethnicity or, you know, religious difference plus gender. Um, and it's very interesting to find out whether men actually have a different type. Actually, you could do a project on convivial labor and gender and explore whether yeah. men have very different strategies of this convivial labor. That would be fascinating. So, yeah, thanks. Next project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did mention that because as Luis and many others know, I'm doing gender and gender migration in the Mexican border. So I found very interesting your presentation, Julia's presentation, because I encounter the same things from, but I look into that from a different perspective from gender. And just to highlight for, you know, for, the, for students mainly, not for you, of course, because you already came to that, but for students, um, mainly that the problems that migrants find they multiply by two louise two mm -hmm. by uh, with women because they have to encounter other sort of problems too um that mm -hmm. are added to their gender can i add something to this though since we're talking about intersectionality i think class comes into the picture as well so yes if i think for example the, the social worker at the focus group he of, of african background he um, was a man and he was middle class, educated. And the participants of the focus group, including the white participants not of the coffee morning, they were working class. And he did not confront any of the, of the racist participants about how they were talking about, um, you know, the colonies and stuff. But I think there was also almost a certain generosity because he sort of implied he had more knowledge and oh you know i've given up these guys they're just you know they're just a good old working class racist kind of thing you know he was um so he was almost above and he felt like he, he was above these debates because he was more educated and he couldn't he didn't want to confront it and i completely completely understood where he was coming i'm not judging him in any way so but just to mention, you know, there's there's these different positionalities and class definitely also comes into the picture. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Uh, we don't have any other questions, um, but just as we sort of move towards a conclusion, I, I just wanted to um, say, Suzanne, that I find your research so fascinating because, as you said at the outset, there's often this kind of narrative that newcomers arrive in an area, migrants arrive in a in a district in London, and it's then how they sort of negotiate their way with the white majority. But as we know, of course, in many of these areas, they hardly ever come across the white majority. It's their encounters with previous white waves of migrants, which is often uh, the most sort of acute interactions. And, and just to say, we've, we've done a project on ageing and migration, it's just recently finished uh, with my colleagues in Sheffield. And one of the things we were interested in doing was, was interviewing older migrants, very similar to your participants actually, who'd lived in neighbourhoods in London for, in some cases, 50, 60, 70 years. You know, they really were almost like they had become the, the locals in those neighborhoods and then how they were responding to kind of recent waves not just of migrants but also of perhaps white middle class gentrification into areas that had previously been very ethnicized areas uh, so that was also really interesting to look at you know this kind of again turns on its head the stereotype of who are the locals and as we know in yeah. london in many of these neighborhoods the locals are earlier waves of migrants and the newcomers may even be white if not migrants, then also perhaps white middle class British coming into an area. Can I add to this very briefly? 
Yeah, sure. That's why I found Andreas Wimmer's work in Switzerland so interesting because he looked at the neighborhood and he, so the Italian and Spanish elderly migrants were the locals. And then there was all these young Swiss sort of alternative left-wing kids coming in and they were actually the outsiders because they broke the rules of civility and order. So yeah, these dynamics of insider and outsider status get turned around sometimes. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Right, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, it's just gone half past three, so I think this is a good time to wrap up. Before everybody leaves and before I thank the speakers, I would like to plug our next event. Um, so, um, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Maria and I are, the, um, are running this research centre and the next session is on the 9th of March, where we move very far away from London. Uh, we, we have the, the word global in the title of the research centre for a reason. We don't just talk about London, although today we had a fascinating conversation about London. But our seminar on the 9th of March is actually um, about religion, identity and power in Turkey and the Balkan regions, obviously a very, very interesting and topical area, the Balkan regions. And so that seminar is taking place on the 9th of March and all the details of all the forthcoming seminars are on the centre website. So please um, investigate that and please book for a future seminar. We'd be delighted to see you all there. I have to congratulate both the speakers because at one point we had over 90 participants on this um, seminar, which is fantastic. Uh, and again, this is one of the silver linings. There aren't many silver linings, but a silver lining of our current lockdown is that we get to have these wonderful events online and we get to have 90 people participating in an online seminar on a wet Wednesday afternoon. So well done, you've attracted a big crowd. So on that point, I would like to thank Suzanne as our external guest speaker today and Julius as our um, internal speaker and your two papers really spoke to each other beautifully and it was a pleasure to listen to them both and I have thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot. So thank you both very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks to the both of you. Very welcome. So as we've mentioned, the session is recorded and in due course, the recording will be put on the centre website and anybody who wants to send the link to their students or anybody else, they'll be welcome to share the, the link to the recording. So on that note, thank you all very much.